I was on a career path that I was very proud of, that I had been very much encouraged of, and that was to pursue pastoral ministry. And so I did that for like 15 years. And then this small little thing called COVID happened. I don't know if you've heard of that. Um, and uh, COVID plays a really important role in my transition. Navarro, welcome to Titans of Transition. I am so glad to be here. Thanks for having me, Joe. Man, you know, I'm really glad you reached out. It, it's been, uh, boy, it's been been a moment or been a while since we uh, saw one another back in Danville at uh, the church we both attended. Yeah, it's been well over a decade, I think. So good to see you. <laughs> Well, I'm really glad you reached out. And after we had that initial conversation, I knew I wanted to have you on, I don't know what to call this, podcast, YouTube channel. It's actually both. So I'll just call it a podcast. Most people know it. Perfect. I know it by that name. So, hey, listen, you know, the whole focus of this is talking with folks about their transitions and what they did to successfully make a career or a life transition. So with that, let's just get right into it. What transition did you want to tell us about today? Yeah, it, it, it was a good one. Uh, I, uh, I, from the time I was about 18 years old, back when you knew me, I mean, this is a long time ago, I was on a career path that I was very proud of, that I had been very much encouraged of, and that was to pursue pastoral ministry. And so I did that for like 15 years. And then this small little thing called COVID happened. I don't know if you've heard of that. Um, and uh, COVID plays a really important role in my transition. But I have left uh, Sunday morning pastoral ministry, and I am now in a new adjacent career field. It's still ministry to me. Uh, it still functions in that role. I work for a nonprofit now called National Christian Foundation. And uh, I'm looking forward to sharing about my story because I think it's a story that can help some people. Oh, that's that's cool. And I haven't had anyone who's been in, made the transition from pastoral ministry into even adjacent or anything really on the podcast. Yeah. So I'm really looking forward to that. And, um, you know, you were, I think, initially in in like youth ministry. Is that correct? I did. I did. A lot of a lot of people who start out in full time ministry, it's kind of hard to jump into adult ministry right away yeah. since you're barely an adult. I started when I was young. And so uh, my entry point was youth ministry, working with teenagers. And I was unapologetic about the fact that I saw that as a stepping stone in my career. Uh, I'm an Enneagram three. And so if your audience knows what an Enneagram three is, I'm, I'm an achiever. And so I very much so had a career arc that I was anticipating. And uh, I set out as an 18 year old to uh, accomplish that arc. And so I, I jumped in with, you know, the kind of the basic basic idea is start out as an intern. And so I was a part-time intern at the church you and I actually went to together, large church. Um, and it was part of a, you know, department of youth ministry. And while I was doing that, I was going to school full time. And so I, uh, in four years, got my degree from Cal State East Bay in, um, well, I got a degree in philosophy with a religious emphasis. And uh, that was enough of a resume piece for me to make the jump from part time intern into full time pastor. And so straight out of college, the spring of my senior year, I started interviewing at churches and uh, had a job waiting for me when I graduated, uh, and it was in Antioch, which you know is about uh, half an hour from where you and I went to church, so a neighboring adjacent community. And uh, that that first pastoral job uh, was a rousing success. I lasted all of 11 months. Um, with, yeah, and so I don't know how many of your listeners have been at a job for less than a year, and there's high turnover, but that was me. Uh, part of that was budget-driven. Um the church had hired me and probably couldn't afford me if we look back on that honestly. And so with some other staffing changes, they just made a choice to, to let me go. And that, that was fine. That turned out to be a blessing to me. At that time, I had started doing my master's work. And so I attended Fuller Theological Seminary. I pursued my master's of divinity, which my whole undergrad was 126 units of education at Cal State East Bay. My master's is 144. So it's bigger than a bachelor's degree. And I know there's master's degrees out there that are, you know, 10 or 12 classes. This was not that. This was 36 courses. And so I pursued my master's of divinity. I started full-time school while I was working at a local pizza shop. And I was just trying to save money and, you know, gain some experience. And 
Uh, then I had a church in Modesto of the Central Valley of California call me and say, hey, we got your name from another church. Would you consider interviewing? I said, I'm not really interested, actually. And they said, well, let us practice on you. So they hired me after, after they decided to practice on me. And uh, I moved to Modesto in 2010 to be a full-time youth pastor uh, and was continuing to pursue my education. And in, in my denominational pool, um, the Masters of Divinity unlocks the key to what's called ordination. And ordination is your bridge typically from a low-paying youth ministry job to a job that's uh, considered a real associate pastor or senior pastor role. Those roles come with pension benefits, medical retirement, uh, their salary minimums. Uh, the ordination track in the denomination that I'm from is a, a really good career path. And I knew that. And so I was preparing to make those steps. And uh, during that season of preparation, doing youth ministry uh, and going to school, I also uh, met a beautiful girl who's now my wife. And uh, I, I shouldn't have said girl. She was a woman. And uh, we <laughs> met at 25 or six years old. And then we had a kid and bought a house and we're living the American dream. And uh, I realized that I was going to need to kind of have a deviation in my career path. And so I took a different youth ministry job at another uh, town, a uh, 15 or 20 minutes away. And, but it was a, a real step up job. This was a non-denominational church. And so they saw it as an associate pastor role. It was uh, pay. I got a 25% raise the day I started, um, which was a huge, a huge deal for me and for my family, better benefits, all those types of things. And I really felt like I was pursuing my career, but I'd kind of pressed pause on making the jump from youth ministry to adult ministry. But I, I, I communicated. Interrupt you a second. So yeah, go when ahead. Did you, when did you press pause? So the phrase that uh, I still stick to to this day was I felt like um, in the Christian faith, we talk a lot about sacrifice. Right? Jesus was the one who sacrificed for us on a, for our sins. And that it mirrors the old Testament system of sacrificing an animal on the altar for your sin. Right. And the altar a L T a R is this theological paradigm of sacrifice. And I felt like God was asking me to take my wife and child off of the altar of sacrifice and put my career on the altar of sacrifice, meaning functionally for people who aren't in the church world, I needed to de-emphasize my career growth and emphasize my pr and prioritize my family life. I had a young child and we were uh, very shortly thereafter expecting twins. And so now I have three boys. They're, uh, well, shoot, nine, six, and six by the time this podcast comes out. And uh, I felt really clearly, which is um, not popular in my industry to de-emphasize the ministry because the ministry is the calling. And uh, working for the Lord, right? How, what, what could be a higher calling than working for the Lord? Well, and, it's eternal. <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. The benefits uh, are excellent. <laughs> they go past uh, death. But uh, I still felt like God was saying, no, hang on a second. Pump the brakes. You need to care for your family well and not uh, burn out. And uh, so I, I, I chose to be obedient to that. And I communicated that as I took this new job. This job had me out one night a week, which for a lot of youth pastors is rare. They're usually out two or three nights a week. Um, like I said, it, it came with some other responsibilities. I joined the adult teaching team at the church. I, I got to do a lot of really great things uh, besides youth ministry that really, I think, was really good for my resume. And yeah, well, so I... Let me just yeah. stop you there again, because as you were talking about the, the your career arc in the church... Um, you know, you, you went from the initial lower level, I'll call it lower level. No, yep. no negative thoughts towards uh, no. masters at all, but, but the typical path and then going to seminary, get, getting your MDiv and then that unlocking the capability of going into the adult side, into the, the pastoral title within that denomination, then taking a church um, and this position that in this non-denom church enabled you to get more involved in on the adult side while still holding that other role um right at the point where you were making that shift that you were looking to do all the all along as you were planning your career out this is when you press pause to, to prioritize your family 
not taking away from your your love and and your commitment to the church and to towards your own personal yeah. ministry, but sure. to get clarity around that and making that was a tough choice because I think people who don't who aren't close to the sort of occupational side of, of the ministry don't really understand how challenging on your time it can be. I mean, it's almost mm -hmm. like being an ER doctor, <laughs> but for the spiritual side, and yes. sometimes, you know, being available to go m to minister in hospitals and, and mm -hmm. that kind of a role as well. But you're always on someone's speed dial and yep. your, your, your loved ones at home get placed on the back burner. Now, some occupations have that, but I think they don't think about the church occupations having that as much. Yeah, no, uh, the way I explain it to people is like, I had a staff of two dozen, they're volunteers, but they were my staff. And if you imagine your staff at a corporate environment, having your cell phone number and, you know, being friends with you and barbecuing with you, you have relationships beyond payroll, beyond your actual responsibilities. They become your community, right? Very few people work, eat, sleep, they do their laundry, deal with their trash all in the same area while you're raising kids together. Well, that's the church. We do everything together, right? And so there's not a lot of boundaries on time. That's for sure. Right. Boundaries. Right. That's cool. So, so I'm, I'm moving forward in my career and uh, getting ready to kind of, you know, I got my job kind of kind of humming along. I called it autopilot in that season. I, I wasn't taking any new mountains. I was just doing what I felt like, you know, one step in front of the no another. Um, and I, I heard it said before, if you're not on the incline, you're either on the recline or the decline. decline. And uh, I was on the recline, but I was heading for decline in terms of my management. And then COVID hit and COVID was weird for the church industry. Like it was for a lot of industries. Uh, our church had never broadcast a service before. And immediately we had to start doing that because, you know, churches shut down, especially in California. And, uh, I was the, one of the younger people on staff and, uh, I had a computer that was capable. And so I started kind of getting pulled into production and broadcast and, um, a lot of youth pastors, uh, as I looked around at my colleagues, they're running through walls to spend time with teenagers when COVID hit. And I was trying to keep the lights on at church. That was kind of my mentality. I was uh, assisting in a lot of other things besides that. And so shortly after COVID hit, like a month or two later, I went to my boss and I said, hey, I think it's time for us to make that transition we knew about a few years ago where I was going to probably leave youth ministry completely and move into adult ministry completely. And I really like to do that here. And I like to be a part of, you know, the solution to that. And I like to hi help hire my replacement to set them up for success. And um, it took them a few months to kind of wrestle with that and digest and look at the budget with COVID happening. And, you know, are we open? Are we closed? All those types of things. And they came back to me a few months later, basically, and said, we don't think there's going to be a spot for you here beyond your role doing youth ministry. We can't fund you doing and adult free. ministry and and." add somebody else to do youth ministry again. And so we kind of came up with an exit strategy that made sense for both of us. And uh, I thought for sure, Joe, that I was going to uh, leave my role at my church and take another pastoral job at another city. And uh, here's how sure me and my family were. We had actually taken all of our family photos off the wall of our house and done some, we had a realtor come through and look at our home and we did some touch up paint and all those things that you do when you're getting ready to sell a house. We actually showed our house to two people before it was about to go on the market. This is December of 2020 when our home value was off the market, uh, just off the charts. We were like, man, we could sell our house right now and make a boatload. And uh, neither one of the people that came through our house was looking, uh, decided to buy it. Uh, and the holidays were right around the corner. This is December of 2020. And so we decided, okay, let's, let's wait till January. And then we'll, we'll put the house on the market in January. Oh. I, we had made plans to move in with my in-laws because we didn't know where we were going yet. I was interviewing with some churches, but we didn't really know what was going to happen. We thought something was eminent and close. Now I want to pause my story there because my wife's story plays a role in my story. And, uh, for anybody who's listening uh, and you think you're on your career journey by yourself, uh, you're not, even if you feel like your role doesn't, um, affect a lot of people around you like work stays at work that kind of mentality it 
especially when you're married, I think um, the effect that that the trauma of transition has on your spouse and, and even your kids can be incredibly understated. So I want to speak to that for a second. Um, out here in California, we had this campaign from our governor called Two Weeks to Flatten the Curve. And so when COVID hit, like March 15th or so of 2020, he came on you know, television and the internet and said, hey, we're going to shut the world down for two, two weeks and well, that'll flatten the curve of COVID. And uh, so everybody stayed home for a couple weeks and we, you know, they closed schools and all that. And we thought maybe April 1st, everything would go back to normal and COVID would be over. And so my wife and I, uh, you know, thinking two weeks to flatten the curve and COVID would go away. We actually made the incredible choice to sign a lease for her, uh, her side hustle business doing charcuterie and cheese. She has a catering business. We signed a lease in week three of COVID for a downtown storefront to open a storefront for uh, my wife's side hustle business that had just kept growing and growing and growing. So three weeks into COVID, we decided to open a storefront. We hired an architect to do some tenant improvement, started paying on this lease, and our plans went to the city. Long story short, they sat on our plans for nine months. So we got to December. My job came to an end, December 4th of 2020. And they still hadn't approved our plans to open our storefront. And we thought, you know, well, let's break our lease. We'll move. We'll start over somewhere else. So Christmas comes, New Year's comes. We're getting ready to put our house on the market like the second or third week of January. And January 4th, we get a call from the city that our plans had been approved. That everybody come back off Christmas off a of furlough from COVID. And they'd approved our plans to do our tenant improvement. Within a week of that, we had an investor call us, cold call us and offered to buy our business from us. Just a wild, wild Before week, right? Opened your business. Yes. Uh, you, we, we, we had been open out of a commissary kitchen, but we hadn't opened our storefront yet. And so this investor saw it as an opportunity to buy low before we established a higher level of, of income. And uh, so we got this offer to, to buy our business. And my wife and I kind of looked at each other. And one of the things that we'd been sensing in our own lives was we really fell in love with our city during COVID um, because COVID one thing that COVID did was it takes all the crutches of social interaction away and you actually get to know your neighbors in our area. And so we're out at the park walking the sidewalks, you know, taking our kids on bike rides and we're having uh, these conversations with people and we're getting to know them. And we just like develop these great friendships and we didn't want to leave those friendships. And so I'm losing, I'm losing my job and my wife gets this offer to buy our business. And I mean, this is the apex of the story, right? We're like, okay, let's pivot like everybody else did in COVID. And we decided to open our business while the sale of our business is going through. And dad becomes stay at home dad. Instead of looking for a job, I actually was given the gift of staying home with my kids, driving carpool, teaching them to read. I bought a little fishing boat. I mean, we, we put more miles on the family van that summer of 2021 than I could shake a stick at. My boys wanted to go to the beach. Let's go. You want to go to the mountains? Let's go. We did everything we could do together, and it was an absolute gift. And I saw it that way. Here's, here's, where, here's a piece of um, wisdom that I gained through that process. When I, when I, lost, when I lost my job... Um, I, I told myself I was going to spend an hour a day intentionally focusing on me. Um, that was physical. It was mental. It was for sure spiritual. There's a, there's a Christian component of this to me. I wanted to spend an hour a day with God focusing on myself, um, kind of as a sabbatical in a sense from the pressure of the go, 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 go. I always say Sunday is always coming in the church world. And so, you know, there's no, there's no let up. And so I spent an hour a day. I got off social media. I quieted all the external voices in my life during that time and um, listened to some podcasts and read some books and opened scripture and had time in prayer. And at the end of those 30 days, I felt like one of my big takeaways was my sense of call or my, my singular purpose that I was focused on, which was being a pastor. The, you know, I, for, as an achiever, I chased that title on my business card for years. I wanted to be that, that, you know, that uh, I've arrived adult pastor. And I felt like God 
and in my own time and my my conversation with my family and my or my wife and mentors, I had that one purpose, that one calling unhook from my identity. And instead I felt like, and here's the phrase, being faithful with whatever is in front of me, whenever it's put in front of me, that was actually my calling for that season, my purpose for that season. And that was my kids. I got to coach little league. I got to volunteer at their school. I mean, I got to do all kinds of things that I never thought I'd get to do. I got to be a good neighbor to my actual neighbors. Now my wife, part of our sale agreement for this business was my wife was going to have a salary and benefits for our family. And so she became the breadwinner. She left for work in the morning and I cooked breakfast, made lunches, all that kind of stuff. Totally, totally upside down family system for us, you know, for the first nine years of our marriage. And we had a one year contract for her, uh, with the, with the sale of the business to kind of see that sale go through and help shepherd the opening of the store and train up the new leaders. And, um, that, that business, that sale year was going to come uh, up. It came up July 30th of, of 2022, which is the year that we're recording the podcast in. It's the end of 2022 here. And um, as we got towards the end of 2021, after six or seven months of you know dadding really hard, um, I knew I was going to have to figure out what my next big thing was going to be. And this is my transition, right? That's the podcast. Um, and so I sat the way this started was I, I asked myself, man, what does my resume on paper and my skill set lend itself to? And uh, I have a theological degree <laughs> and a philosophy degree. And in case you haven't noticed it, um, the philosophy factories, they were shut down a long time ago. There's, <laughs> there's, It's not a readily hireable degree, right? And my experience is not in the corporate world or sales or whatever. And so I thought, man, what could I do with my skill set, my people skill set, my kind of ability to to speak and understand the world of a nonprofit. And I I've always had a nose for dollars within nonprofits. I've, I've been a part of more staff meetings than I care to mention where somebody had a great idea for their nonprofit and somebody had to tell them there ain't no money to do that. Um, I kind of fundamentally reject that thesis. I, I kind of believe that there is the resources out there. It's a matter of connecting the resources to the projects. And um, so I said, you know what? I think I could be a major donor officer. I think I could get into that philanthropy space and kind of help raise money for nonprofits. And so um, I was on a fishing trip with some men up in the mountains, and we were sitting around a campfire. It was my dad and his friends and some family members and uh, I just got out of town to go fishing with with some guys for a, a week, a long weekend, and we're sitting around the campfire. And my dad's best friend is actually uh, a former development officer for University of Pacific, and we're sitting around the campfire having a scotch and a cigar. I don't know if I can say that on the podcast, but that's <laughs> you can say it, of course. Yeah, I, I like Jesus and I like scotch. That's fine. And so we're sitting around the campfire, and uh, I, I'm telling him about this pivot I'm thinking about in my life, and he goes. Well, Danny, because he knows me as Danny, he's known me that long since I was 10 years old. And uh, he says, you know, I think you'd be great in that world. And I- I'd love to help you. I'd love to mentor you a little bit. I'd love to be your, your, a little bit of a guide or resource for you. And uh, what a gift that was to have somebody oh, yeah, I have a who had been... question for you, Dan. Oh, yeah. Did this interaction with him come before or after you had come to the... I'll use the word revelation or the conclusion that you would, we're going to lean into this financial space. It, I honestly, I think it was kind of the, the straw that broke the Impulse. camel's back. Yeah. It, it, it was, it was the thing that put a nail in the coffin for me of this other career that I thought was going to be my lifelong pursuit, which was pastoral ministry. And right. to have somebody close to me, who's known me for decades, look at me and say, I think you could be really successful at this other thing. So that was, was that was enough. Moment. This was one of yes. those moments, right? It really this was. was. Moments or whatever. Uh, and it was on the front end or was this idea kind of in your headspace yet about, was it a confirmation of what you were thinking it, or was it sort of the beginning it, of it? It wasn't, it wasn't the spark. I'd had the idea before I sat around that campfire, but I didn't know where to, I didn't know where to start. And so for him to say, I can help you start, like, here's a book or two to read. 
here's here's he goes here's what i want you to do i want you to make a list of the top 10 nonprofits that are within driving distance for you that aren't churches so we have a grief house we have you know um salvation army we have some drug rehab places he goes i want you to make a list of them and i want you to call their ceo or their development officer if they have one and i want you to ask them for an inv informational interview just ask take them to lunch or coffee and say, hey, I'm looking at getting into your space. Tell me about your day. What does your life look like? And by doing that, you're going to do some networking naturally. They're going to go, oh, you're. I spent half an hour, 45 minutes with Dan Navarra, and he seems sharp. I, I think he could be an asset to our team down the road when we have an opportunity. And you're going to grow, Dan, by learning about what, like, what you can expect to be in that role. And so I did that. I started down this path of everybody I could get my hands on who was in the fundraising space in Stanislaus County, I asked them for lunch <laughs> and uh, had these meetings and it was really helpful. It was also confirming because a lot of those people knew me already just naturally from being, I was employed at a nonprofit. And um, through that whole process, now here's where things get wild. My wife's business is going really well. I, it's been a crazy story already, but this is where it gets even more nuts. My wife's business is going really well. And they're doing lunch service now. I mean, things are just screaming along. And my mom is out with some girlfriends in our neck of the woods doing a, they call it, they have a grandma group. It's their Grammy group. And the Grammy group, my mom decides to treat the women to lunch at my wife's store uh, after one of their outings. And they're sitting around there talking about their kids and their grandkids as, you know, Grammys do. And uh, my mom says, well, Dan's looking at leaving pastoral ministry and going into philanthropy and fundraising. And one of the women there says, oh, well, you should have him call my husband. He's, and you would know this name, Joe, if I sold you the name because it's an old CPC name from our, our church days. But anyway, she, so I call her husband on Monday and he knows me as Danny too, same as my dad's best friend, and says, hey, I'm so glad you called. I've known you for 20 years. I know your family. I know who you are and what you're about. I think you'd be great in this space. And I'd love to make some phone calls for you on your behalf to some CEOs wow. and people, organizations I know. I'm like, this is the best phone call I've ever had on a Monday morning. It's like December 15th, 2021. Okay. He says, well, hey, let's set up lunch in January. We'll do lunch in January. And uh, I'll get to know you again. Send me a resume and a cover letter and we'll talk in January. So we set up for lunch in January. A few days later, he calls me back after I send him my resume and my cover letter. He says, Danny, I know I told you I wasn't going to present you to any companies before, you know, we had lunch, but I happen to be on a call with Brian Feller of National Christian Foundation in California. And uh, by the way, he goes, I'm a volunteer halftime gift advisor for National Christian Foundation. You ever heard of it? I said, no. He goes, Tell me more. He says, well, I'm on a call with Brian Feller and we're looking for somebody in your territory who could work with our company. And I think he'd be great at it. I said, that's okay. fantastic, Vern. Thanks. Okay. So he goes, so, yeah, I mean, just jump in here. So the reason why is probably people are listening to this are sensing the same thing. And that is for those who aren't close to the church or share sure. our faith, they're going to look at this and say, Oh, this feels like the law of attraction for those who are closer to us. They're going to think, Oh, this looks like provision. Yes. Everything's being cleared out of the way and people are being presented into your life as you're leaning into where God has gifted you. Yes. Uh, but you I'd also, language. I had also taken steps. I'd also taken pragmatic sure. steps. This was not blind faith. I had completely revamped my resume. I mean, a church resume. I had put together a really nice cover letter and I, I was prepared for that moment because of right. some mentors that had said, here's some things that you can do to position yourself. Because when the conversation comes, you have to be ready for it. And I, and I was ready. I was ready to receive the ball that was thrown my direction. Right. Right. Um, so Vern says, I want to just tell you that before Christmas. Sorry, that was the name of the gentleman who I, I called on that Monday. And he says, Let, let's talk in January. I just wanted to give you some good news before Christmas. I said, great. So we keep our lunch appointment in January. I show up to lunch and there's another person from National Christian Foundation at the lunch. I didn't even know he was going to be there. I was walking into an interview and within a few months, they had offered me a position with National Christian Foundation. And Joe, I'm in my sweet spot. I, I love what I get to do and who I get to do it with. I feel like I'm fully alive in this new industry, in this new role that I have. 
and it, it's been an absolute gift. And it was it wasn't all sunshine and roses getting into it. Uh, the first question when we had lunch was about Mrs. donor advised funds, and I'd never heard of a donor advised fund. That's not exactly how you want to go into an interview. And uh, they walked with me through it, and they've taught me what I need to learn technically so that I can do the job well. And now I'm I'm enjoying my career more than I ever thought I would. It's been great for my family life balance. Um, yeah, I'm in a good spot now. Ben, I have I have this uh, theory that I've been sort of pounding in the last few episodes. You know, other people say this too. It's not original, but when you get into your sweet spot, when you get into mm -hmm. your your area of, of gifting, what God has given you to do, yeah, it can be intense. It can be super busy, but it's also very energizing. You're not drained. And so oh. you just said that, that you just, it just brought that thought back to mind that, you know, you're definitely hard after, but you just know it's confirmed, you know, by how you feel, how you resonate with it. I, I've said to many people over the years, I think there's a group of people in the world that work nine to five so that they can live from five to nine. And then there's a group of us that just get to live. And when you're doing a job that is fulfilling and it's not a grind for you to want to get up in the morning and go do it, um, that allows you to live your life in other spaces uh, and pushes you to be the best version of yourself. Uh, but it's pushing you in a way that is open-handed and inviting rather than um, you will meet the quota or else you won't have a job, right? There's two different voices yeah. of, of invitation in, into growth. I, I just get to live. And, um, you know, we're doing a really important work with donors. Uh, we do a really important thing for our industry, which, you know, I use the phrase, the kingdom of God. We serve a very specific target group of that audience. And um, it's really important what we do. And it's fulfilling oh. and it's fun. Yeah, so why don't you just take a few minutes and give us sort of the spiel? <laughs> yeah. When you when you connect with someone, and people probably have, uh, you know, as you've described this, they kind of have an idea, a rough idea of what you're talking about, donors and gifting. Yeah. But give the context, because there are people out there who have resources who are looking to be matched up with opportunities to give to mm -hmm. that it's – that serves what they want to do. So tell us, tell us what you do and what the organization does. Uh, give us a little bit more understanding for that. Yeah, sure. So uh, the, the main crux of the idea is a lot of people have a financial strategy who are listening to this podcast. You have a, a CPA, you have a financial advisor, your investment portfolio, your retirement, all that kind of stuff. Target. Every, a lot of people, everybody should have those people in their life. A lot of people have a financial advisor, but they don't have a giving advisor. They don't have, they have a financial strategy, but they don't have a giving strategy. National Christian Foundation, NCF, we specialize in helping um, high capacity Christians figure out how to do tax smart giving strategies. Um, we help them figure out what they're passionate about and what they want to give to. Um, because a lot of people have been given a lot. And our mindset is everything has been entrusted to us by God. And so if we are not owners, we are stewards. How can we best steward what has been entrusted to us? And we help people do that practically um, and also theologically. So the practical side of it is there are some incredible tax efficient tools out there um, that people don't know about to help them with their giving. The, the principal product that we talk about is a donor advised fund. Um, some of your audience will know what that is. Some of your audience won't, but a donor advised fund functions as a charitable checking account. So like Joe, you have a savings account, you have a checking account, um, you do charitable giving, but you don't have a charitable checking account to do that giving from that you fund the account. And then you give from there. Uh, you probably just take from your checking account to do your charitable giving and a donor advised fund with national Christian foundation allows you to give the money to NCF. We're the 501c3 that gives you your charitable deduction receipt. So you get one charitable deduction receipt that you can download from your phone anytime you want. And then from that pot of money that you give to us, you can advise grants to nonprofits all over the world. And uh, we send them a check the next day. It's very simple and easy. It's a streamlined process. It makes it convenient for people who support a lot of charities 
makes it so that you have one charitable deduction receipt to itemize rather than having to go get 9, 10, 12, 15 different charities that you support and uh, puts it all in one spot. That's the simplest version of what we do. And what a donor advised fund really allows you to do is it allows you to give appreciated assets beyond cash. So most people in the world do their charitable giving with cash. They go to the banquet dinner and they write a check for a thousand dollars. God bless them. Um, most people's wealth, your and mine included, is not in our checking account. It's in our investments. It's in our appreciated assets, whether it's a stock portfolio, some real estate property, or even a business interest. A donor advised fund and National Christian Foundation actually has the tools and systems built with gift attorneys um, and advisors and CPAs to be able to gift an appreciated asset, stock, real estate, property, or even business interest. If you own a business that you started in your garage for zero dollars and now it's worth 10 million bucks, if you want to sell that business, you're going to have massive capital gains on that. Yeah. And the donor advised fund allows you to give a, a percentage of that business or all of it if you wanted to, to charity before a potential sale, a future potential sale, and you get a fair market value deduction for the amount of appreciated business that you give or whatever asset it is at the time of the gift. And then when the thing liquidates, that percentage goes into your giving fund and you get to use, do charitable giving with it and it optimizes your tax situation. It optimizes your tax situation and also um, maximizes your gift potential too. Yes. Right? Because yes. That, that's awesome. That's really... That's and it, it preserves amazing. liquidity from for what you were doing with your other cash on hand because now you're giving from an asset rather than giving from your checking account. Yeah. That's that's great. Uh, so what we will do is in the show notes, um, we'll definitely put your contact information for anyone who happens to listen is interested in talking to you about this. Sure. Um, if you could just give us sort of how people can reach you right now. All yeah. Day. At, at NCF, so we're a national company. I work with the California chapter. So if you're in Florida listening to this, that's fine. We have p folks in Florida who I can put you in touch with in a moment's notice. But you can email me at D Navarra. That's D as in dog, N A V A R R A at ncfgiving.com. NCF, National Christian Foundation, giving.com. And uh, if you drop me an email, uh, if you're in California, I'll chat with you. And if you're not, I'll put you in touch with somebody right away. And here's the deal. We're not like a lot of um, other financial institutions. We're a ministry. We're a nonprofit. And so uh, our time doesn't have an hourly rate attached to it. We would love to just talk with you right. through your giving strategy. If you're just interested in a conversation with somebody, you go, oh, I've never thought about a donor advice fund before. I've never even heard of that. Tell me more. Happy to do that on a Zoom call anytime. That's great, Dan. Thanks a lot. And I will put those specific addresses in the in the show notes as well, uh, everyone. So it'll make it easy for you to copy and paste that in. So, Dan, let's talk. Let's do a sort of a wrap up section here. So if you look sure. back over those transitions and you've had you've had some wild transitions. Yeah, it's I have fun. to say, this is really fun to talk about. But as you look back over those, you had some moments, but what what uh, for you, what do you think were lessons learned that others may benefit from hearing? Uh, so a couple come to mind immediately. Um, the first one is the removal of noise from my life allowed me to do the soul work and the mental work, uh, both internally and with my spouse to pull the trigger on a transition. And my, really my transition is two transitions. I transitioned into being a full-time stay-at-home dad and then I tr changed careers. Uh, I had to wrestle with my identity from going from always chasing the title on a business card to not having a business card. <laughs> um, and That's so the, yeah, the, the removal of external voices um, and choosing what voices I wanted in my life, I didn't turn off mentors which is my second kind of piece of advice. I started immediately asking people that I trusted from over the last 10 or 20 years, Hey, I'm looking for input. I'm looking for you to listen on my behalf and, and help shepherd me. I'm, um, do, I think a, a lot of people are too proud to ask for help when they're in transition. It's like, um, when you're drowning, um, it takes people, I was a lifeguard for a long time. 
People are very hesitant to yell for help when they're drowning. They try to figure it out and try, they exhaust themselves trying to save themselves. And usually it's too late by the time they're saying help. People have a hard time saying, hey, I need others. And so I think a second piece is, no, don't, don't go it alone. Um, there's an old African proverb that says, alone we go fast, but together we go far. And I believe in that wholeheartedly. There's a scripture that says that same kind of thing in Ecclesiastes where it says three strands of rope aren't easily broken. Uh, one strand of rope is broken. And so who can you intertwine yourself with? What three strands of rope, two people that you can have in your life that can speak honestly to you um, and coach you when you, you know, um, that you can invite to give unsolicited, uns, unsolicited feedback we don't live in a culture that receives feedback very well. And when you're in transition, uh, a mentor of mine once said, whenever there's change, there's trauma. And so being able to accept the trauma and have people care for you through that trauma, speak hard things to you through that, that change and transition, I, I think it's why I'm still here and why I've come out on the other side um, in, a better in a better spot. And I realize not everybody's story has a, a good ending to it like mine does, but... Um, it didn't always seem like it was going to have that ending. Yeah, it, it doesn't. And uh, that's awesome. So it was like, uh, quiet, the noise, and mm -hmm. the other voices. And the other point was, and that was part of your soul work. So you were listening, you were leaning in intentionally to the voice you wanted to hear. Yes. And then you were asking for help and not, and not being, uh, not feeling weird about asking for help. Yeah. Um, when I, when I say turn off the external voices, I don't mean other people. Like I'm talking uh, like, about the social media stuff. Or? Yeah. I, I, I logged off for 30 days and it was huge for me. Yeah. Um, yeah. cause you're not dealing with the political, this, that, and the other thing. And, you know, I can get caught up on everybody else's pictures and vacations at the end of that. Um, and then, you know, my, my TV consumption, all that, that t tended to shift. I, I had some healthier rhythms in that season where I was intentionally trying to care for myself physically, mentally, spiritually. Um, you know, I went for walks uh, with, with no headphones in. Yeah. I went, things like yeah, that. I think you get the other thing on a practical level, you just, you get deplete. You're sort of on that hamster wheel constantly. Oh yeah. And, and uh, you, it's weird. I mean, you were so driven by habit and, and, and our schedules that, um, you know, we, we consume more time than we're aware of on TV, social media, whatever it would be mm -hmm. in this very thin and, and um, non-fulfilling space. And so if you need to do deep work like this, you need to get focused. You need to be intentional about about investing. You talk about investing yourself, but it's investing in yourself in the sense of opening up the space mm -hmm. to have that deeper dialogue. Yes. Yes. Creating hey, space man. was a huge piece of this. Yeah. Yeah. So that's awesome. Dan, I just thank you so much for, for bringing these transition stories. And uh, I think it's going to resonate with, with many. You don't have to be, it was very general. It's, it's not that you'd have to be, it's sort of in the Christian career space. Mm -hmm. um, these are, are universal truths, I think, that would serve anyone well. And uh, again, uh, thank you so much for coming on Tights of Transition. Is there any closing thoughts you have that you want I, to put down? I think, yeah, I'm glad you asked. I think my closing thought is actually for people who would say, hey, you know, I, I believe in God, but maybe they uh, haven't been walking with God in, in a way that is, you know, I was coming from a pastoral background, so every day I'm doing spiritual things. Um, you can use your transition as an opportunity to focus on the main thing being the main thing, the ma you know, keeping the main thing. And it might be an opportunity for you to return to a, a faith route that maybe was more present in your life at a different season. Uh, I talked about doing that internal work. I mean, frankly, it was spiritual work mostly. It was me doing business with God and feeling like God was giving me some release. And so uh, you may feel like that is exclusive to pastors, but I would say it's not. And you can intentionally pursue that easily. You're also welcome to email me about that. I'd be happy to talk to anybody about that if they want a little um, coaching in that regard. So that that's it for me, Joe. Thanks. That's great. That's great. Listen, thanks a lot. And uh, again, uh, put all this information in the show notes. Uh, please do reach out to Dan if you have any questions, regardless of the sphere. I can tell you from the heart. He is there for you. So hmm. 
Thanks Thank again you. for joining us on Titans of Transition. Hey, thanks for joining me today on Titans of Transition. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Please check the show notes for additional information.